but we don't know. They're all suspect. Not only have we done this around the world by lobbing uh, cruise missiles and uh, drone missiles, uh, we have now had an announced policy in this country by the current president that this is legitimate policy to assassinate American citizens. No charges made, no trial. The president himself becomes the prosecutor. He becomes the judge, the jury, and the executioner. Because um, yeah, there are, I'm sure there are bad people. This Alaki obviously was uh, fomenting uh, 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 cr crimes and violence, although he was never charged with a crime. But uh, he was deemed a very dangerous person, so he was targeted and he, and he was killed. He was the first American that openly was targeted by our government and was assassinated along with uh, a bystander, another American citizen was killed. But that wasn't enough. Our government said no, I, they thought that his son was also much involved. So therefore, a week or so later, they sent another cruise missile uh, drone attack and they, uh, you know, bombed and killed their, his son, a lucky son. But then when they found out, they don't talk about this case, because when they found out about it, the kid was 16 years old, and he was in the backyard barbecuing with a friend of his. But he never, he was never charged. But people say, well, there's still just a couple. Still, don't worry about it. These are bad people. But what we must worry about is the rule of law because the rule of law protects us and more, and that has to be protected. Our economy needs a lot of adjustment. We've talked a lot about monetary policy, and uh, we get into this trouble because of the financial bubbles created by our Federal Reserve System. I do not believe we can get out of this mess without understanding how the business cycle works. The business cycle works merely by the federal government coming to in through, through the uh, combination of congressional law and the uh, Federal Reserve. They create excessive money, drive interest rates down. The message we get from low interest rates is that there's a lot of savings, and then businessmen overinvest, build too many houses, prices go up too high in certain areas, bubbles form. So the reason we're in a deep recession, depression at the moment is because we had a huge financial bubble that was patched together over these last 40 years, and it finally met the point of no return. Now, what have been the tools when there's an, there's an attempt of the market to correct things? The government has always resorted to spending more money and printing more money. And it tended to help over these years, but now it doesn't help anymore. How can you lower interest rates? They're below zero right now. They can't get much lower than that. How can they increase spending when there is no money? And uh, our national, our, our deficit this year is $1.5 trillion. That cannot solve the problem. When there are mistakes, when there's overinvestment, when prices go up too high, this has to be liquidated. We would have done much better if in 2008 the government would have just stepped back, don't, and, and would not have bailed out the rich bankers and the corporations. We'd have been better off. But we were, we were warned that uh, there, uh, there would be a great danger and there was fear built up. And they said if we don't bail out the system, there would be a depression. Well, guess where the depression would have been? It would have been on those who were receiving our money. Instead, the depression was delivered to the people, the middle class. They lost their jobs and they lost their houses. And we, the taxpayer, absorbed the debt. The bad debt was transferred from the illiquid operations of the banks and the mortgage companies and delivered to the Treasury as well as the uh, Federal Reserve. So it's just a transfer. This is just prolonging the agony. This is what Japan has done for 20 years. This is what we did in the Depression. The main reason that they keep doing this is because the ideas that have infiltrated Washington for many decades has been have been driven by Keynesian economics, we have to repeal Keynesian economics and introduce free market economics. Those of us who have advocated this position say, well, they don't understand because you can't have inflation. Uh, if you inflate, if you increase the money supply in a weak economy, that won't cause inflation. 
Well, the only thing they forget about is that you can have stagflation and you can have inflationary depressions because once you print a lot of money, you devalue the currency. And that is what we're doing. You can't get out of this trouble by just printing the money and uh, may, trying to maintain a system that is not viable. What has happened to us is we've lost our confidence that a free society actually works, that free market works, that we have lost the confidence that property is supposed to be owned by the people and not controlled by the government. Yeah. But our, our property really isn't our own. We pay huge taxes and we have to ask a lot of permission before we can use our land and sometimes we can't use it because uh, we can't get around all the regulations. But this isn't a partisan issue. You know, when we got into some trouble uh, 10 years ago, approximately, when Enron failed and Republicans were in charge, they said, well, there weren't enough regulations. So what they did was they passed uh, Sarbanes-Oxley. It is, it is estimated now, and, and by the way, there were a total of three of us that voted against that. That's how uniform the, the whole system was, more regulations as, as a solution. But it is estimated now that Sarbanes-Oxley has cost this economy a trillion dollars in these past 10 years. It is also estimated that, um, that Dodd-Frank, the new regulatory bill that's been there a year, it has cost or will cost a trillion dollars as well. And then uh, there is this other little item thrown out at us uh, to further undermine our liberties and our freedom of choice. Is the, uh, is the Obama medical care program. That's another huge monster. So <clears throat> whether it's medical care or education or housing, when governments get involved, they print the money, they create inflation in those areas. When you increase the money supply, all prices and all labor prices do not go up evenly. They go up unevenly. So what have we done for education and housing and et cetera? We want, uh, you know, the, uh, those who are motivated, many by, with good intentions, uh, and they say, well, we want to help the people who can't afford it and make sure they get an education. So what have we done? We illegally, in the federal government, because there's no authority in the federal government to be involved in education, they take over education and create a department of, like a department of education, which we should abolish. Yeah. a lot of money into the educational system. Did the quality of education go up? No. Did the price of education go up? Skyrocketing. So what happens? We have a lot more graduates have, graduating with poor education, not well trained, and no jobs. And now students getting out of college right now owe more money than all our credit cards. That's how big it is. So the system fails. This whole program of giving everybody a house, that failed. They, they're end up losing their houses. And in medicine, it's the same thing. They pump a lot of money into medicine. They take away our right of freedom of choice. And we end up with high cost of medicine, the quality of medicine going down. But there's a lot of special interests that control uh, these programs. Uh, for instance, in medicine, uh, whether the Republicans are passing a bill or the Democrats are passing a bill, guess who line up as the lobbyists? Drug companies and insurance companies, and they're the ones who help write these bills. And this is the reason your cost of medicine continues to go up. But what else do they do? What else does the drug company do to interfere with your freedom of choice? Because right now, your freedom of choice of looking at alternative medical programs and medical care and nutritional product is always being curtailed because of the drug companies. We should make sure that everybody has free choices in all that they do and make sure that you have a freedom of choice in your medical products as well. You know, talking about the, uh, the war on drugs and all the tragedy that comes from that, uh, the, the addiction rate from conventional medicine and uh, legalized medication is much, much greater problem than it is on the, on the illegal drugs. But one, of, but one of the um, one of the silliest things that uh, we have done uh, is we we've taken this war on on marijuana and said, well, there is another plant that sort of looks like marijuana, although you can't smoke it and you can't use it for much other than industrial products. We have to make it illegal as well. 
So what have they done? They've decided that nobody in this country can raise hemp. You know, it's an industrial product. It could create thousands and thousands of jobs. In the 19th century, there were thousands of farms that raised this. In times of war, we've encouraged people to raise it because of the alternative uh, things that they can do. So what do we do? There are a lot of raising in Canada. They make products and they sell us the products from Canada. But all we have to do is not, we don't have to understand each little issue. All we have to do is legalize freedom. And these would be probably be solved. Uh, and enthusiasm for liberty. But the one thing that I have noticed, especially coming and talking with young people, this is where I get my encouragement. The spirit of liberty is alive and well with many, many young people and a large number of remnant. The people in the remnant has been, have been around for a good many years and haven't had a voice whatsoever. So I believe, I believe uh, you cannot stop an idea whose time has come. And the idea of liberty, the time has returned to us. <laughs> Something happened approximately 100 years ago when uh, freedom was chopped up into pieces. Freedom is the freedom to run your life and uh, also to keep the fruits of your labor which means we shouldn't have an income tax either. But for some, but for some reason, uh, one group decided they'd defend economic liberty, and that was good. Then another one said, well, no, we're going to not have economic liberty, but we want to protect personal choices and pers personal lifestyles. But why is it that we have to have two parts of freedom? Why shouldn't freedom be one thing? Our right, our natural right to our life, a natural right to our liberties. And that means that we have control of our lives. We're in charge of our lives, not the government. So uh, the income tax, the income tax makes the assumption that everything you earn belongs to the government. And then on their permission, the permission of the government, you're allowed to keep a certain percentage of your income under certain conditions. So that is the destruction of liberty. We did at one time have the greatest understanding and the greatest prosperity of any nation on earth. But now we, we aren't in, in that category. Another uh, issue that I think demonstrates uh, the importance of understanding the right to your life and the ownership of your own life is the principle of the military draft. I know we don't have a draft now, but we still have registration just in case. But we've had a draft. I happen to have been drafted uh, back in the 1960s. But when the government has you have all 18-year-olds still sign up, it's a, it's a messy sense. We own you. We can take you. We can use you. If we need to fight a war, and it's a legitimate war, we've been attacked. It should be done deliberately through the people and there are members of Congress voting for it and not by one person in Washington, one president, to go to war or under the UN or the IMF and there should never be a draft but we should all be willing to defend our country. Freedom has not been around a terribly long time. If you look at all of history and if you look at the current history around the world today, uh, most of it is tyranny, tyrants, people wanting to run other people's lives. And there are many in Washington uh, uh, that have been running our foreign policy in both parties for a good many years now. They say that America is an exceptional nation. In a way, and our history could show that maybe we have some exceptional traits. But what they mean by exceptionalism and that we have this moral obligation to spread our values mean that we do this by force, that we go over and tell other people how they have to live. But guess what? Special interests get control of that attitude, and lo and behold, they help some countries that are on their way to democracy. Uh, they hurt those countries, and then they prop up many dictators. If you look at our history over the past 20 years, so many of the bad guys have both been our friends and our enemy. They're our friends as long as they do our bidding. They're our enemies if they don't listen to us. You know, that we've been offered two types of foreign policy, basically, over these many years. One says that uh, we go to a country and we ask them to do something and to be on our side. And if they do it, we give them a lot of money. Then we go to somebody else and they say, no, we're not going to do it. We're our own country. So then we bomb them. 
I think there should be another option. 